Hello, Hello so, how are you? Very good, thank you. So who's who? Tell me who's who. I'm Ritwik and he's Sorak. Hi. The silent Hello. one is Sorak. Yeah. <laughs> Gentlemen, thank you very much for coming on to uh, B-Sides 2020 Virtual Edition. You're very going to be talking great. about FP Analyze, aid in exploitation yeah. with automated analysis. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to ask you to immediately start your presentation. And yeah. um, I will be keeping an eye out for any questions. As I mentioned before, folks, uh, please ask your questions in the YouTube chat uh, chat box, and I will keep an eye out for them. So please, Ritvik and Surag, take it away. Yes, sure. Thank you. So I hope it's good. Yeah. 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 to go, I guess. So just let us know when, when we can start. Yeah, you can start now. Go. Thank you. Hello, guys. Today we are going to introduce our tool, FP Analyze, which will aid in exploitation with automated analysis. I am Ritwik, and I'm currently pursuing my third year in CSE at Amrita University, Kerala. I regularly play CTMs with team buyers. I do Linux binary exploitation, and I have a keen interest in memory corruption and vulnerability research. I'm Saurav, and I am also pursuing my third year in CSE at Amrita University. I usually do binary exploitation, but um, right now I'm mainly focusing on the kernel exploitation. So about our team, BIOS, it is the number one CTF team of India. It was founded in 2008 by our mentor, Sri Vipin Pavitran. The members of our club engage actively in security research, and we conduct international CTFs on an yearly basis. So let us now move to the agenda of today's talk. But before just jumping to the tool, to be able to use it efficiently, we need to have arbitrary memory read and write primitives. Wait, what are these? So first, we'll be looking into unveiling the attack surfaces and have a quick overview of primitives. Then we'll also see a few common vulnerabilities on stack and heap, which can be chained to get arbitrary read write, and thus making it perfect for our FP analyze to come into picture. Note that there are many other ways we can get arbitrary memory read or write. But for the sake of brevity, we will discuss only the stack overflow, format string, heap overflow, and use after free. So let's get started. Before, after following this, once we have a proper understanding of primitives and a few common vulnerabilities, we are all set to introduce our FP analyze, where we'll see why we need FP analyze. We'll have a quick overview of its working. Then we'll also see what the core idea behind FP analyzes. Then we'll go a little into its internals of the implementation. And towards the end, we also intend to have a small live demonstration with CTF style binaries. So it's not about the bugs you ultimately discover. It's about the primitives you find along the way. So you can guess it. We are moving towards unveiling the attack surfaces and get a quick overview of primitives. But wait, what is a primitive? See, the modern exploitation tactics can be broken down into exploitation primitives. They can be assumed to be building blocks of an exploit, simple as it is. But in a broad sense, primitives can be divided into two types. The first one is arbitrary memory read primitive. And the second one is arbitrary memory write primitive. We'll have a look at them one by one. So. First, what is arbitrary memory read? See, arbitrary memory read lets you read or leak addresses of memory segments. But why do you need to leak memory? The reason is that 
you can't directly copy addresses from memory and give that in your exploit. The compiler, you see, enforces randomization techniques like address space layer randomization, ASLR technique, which randomizes almost all memory segments. Hence, to successfully exploit a program, the very first step is to leak memory address of segments, which are of our interest, like the libc segment, you know, which has functions like system. So CTFS, that's for you. So now we will realize arbitrary memory read with a very small example. Here, in this sample example, you can see that I have two long integer pointers, read PTR and write PTR. For now, just forget about write PTR. So the program asks for an address. It takes that address and writes whatever is there at that address. So this is a classical example of what arbitrary memory read is. You can give any address and get the data at that address. Cool, isn't it? So now, since now we compile this program with the suitable flags, but you can see that since PIE randomization technique is disabled in compile time, we can still use hard-coded address of the program's global text segment. Wait, what is that? This segment is called a BSS, and it contains addresses of libc functions which are used during the execution of program. See, a table which maintains all such ad libc addresses in the BSS segment of the program is called the global offset table, GOT in short. Now, if we give the global offset table address of the function putS, See, you saw that putS was being called during the program. Hence, we can use the global offset table address of putS. We get the data inside it as the output. See, you can see that data. But the data is nothing but the libc address of putS. Once we have leaked addresses of any memory segment protected by ASLR or PI, we can offset to any memory location with that segment, within that segment, and get addresses of useful functions like system. So now, moving on to the arbitrary memory write primitive. See, arbitrary memory write primitive basically lets, in, lets attacker control data to be written to attacker controlled memory location. So you can write something somewhere. This is most powerful primitive as it can give us arbitrary code execution. Let us realize arbitrary memory write primitive with a small example. Here you can see that we have the same previous example, but in, in, in place of read PTR, we are now going to use our write PTR. So we take an address, we take a value, and then we write the value to that address. So attacker control value to an attacker control address. So now let us run this example. And same as previous, we are going to give the got address of putis as the program is compiled without the PIE randomization technique. And we give the decimal value of 0x414141, which is the standard AAAAA. So you can see that in memory, before the overwrite had happened, the got address of putis is having the libc address of putis. But after we have overwritten, you can see that the putis address has been successfully overwritten with our input 0x41414. This is a classical example of how we can write anything anywhere. So together, if arbitrary memory read and write can exist in a program, we can be sure in some way that the program can be pawned. So now that we know how powerful arbitrary memory read and write primitives can be, let us try to understand a few common vulnerabilities which are still prevalent in the world of security. When we begin to exploit a program, we always try to convert our bugs into exploitation primitives that we have discussed so far. So we'll be looking into the stack-based vulnerabilities, starting with Stack Overflow. You see, Stack Overflow is the most common type of vulnerability we see now and then. To understand this, let us take a quick look at a sample program. So in this program, you see that I have a buffer of size 16, and I'm taking 32 bytes into a buffer of size 16, which means it is for sure that an overflow exists here. But to realize and understand an overflow, we also need to see how the stack looks like. So you can see that 
before the attack, the stack of any function will look like this. So it will have the parameters of the function passed on the stack, then the return address of the caller function, and then the base pointer followed by the buffer and all the local variables down the stack. But in an attack scenario, as you can see, we have buffer of size 16, and we can give 32 bytes of input, which means we can over we can fill this buffer of size six, size 16, and then we can also corrupt the base pointer, and finally corrupt the return address. But wait, how does corrupting return address do anything? See, return address basically controls where the program will go after the function has finished. So if you can overwrite the return address with an attacker controlled value, you can return to any function or any address. That's pretty cool. Yeah. So what we'll do now is, since we know that the size of our buffer is 16, and then the next 8 bytes, see, here we are assuming the architecture to be 64-bit architecture. So stack will be 8 bytes aligned. Now, as you saw in the previous example, the a picture of stack, we had the first 16 bytes for the buffer, the next 8 bytes for the base pointer, and finally, the next 8 bytes will corrupt the return address. So we pipe the input to the binary that we are running, and you can see that the program has clearly set faulted. So to understand this, we have to see what happens before and after an overflow has happened. So before an overflow, you can see the stack is quite innocent. Uh, the return address is still intact on the stack. And you can see that the return address is pointing to libc start mains right. So it's it's fine. But you can see that after the overflow has happened, the return address is corrupted with our input. Hence, if the input is a valid address, you can jump to any attacker controlled place and even pop a shell. So, so now we'll go on and see what format string vulnerability is. Hey, format string is one of the most powerful vulnerabilities, which can be easily molded to achieve memory read and write simultaneously. See, it's, it's cool, right? Yeah. So we will realize format string with a small example. Here we have buffer of size 16, and we are taking 16 bytes of input into that buffer. And we are calling printf of buffer without any format specifiers. So when there are no format specifiers, our input can contain, can contain untrusted format specifiers, which means we can now read and write using these format specifiers. Let us see how we can do that. So to understand how format string works, we have to also see the state of the stack at the instance when the vulnerable printf is called in the program. You can see that at the instance when the vulnerable printf is called, our input, which is AAA as usual, is on top of the stack. And there are, among a few other things, there is also the return address, which is stored on the stack. Now, to realize format string, we have to also understand how arguments are passed to a function. In case of 64-bit architecture, the first six arguments are passed through registers, and subsequent arguments are passed on stack. So if we see the first six arguments are registers, and this from the sixth argument, we can see that everything was on stack. So seventh argument, eighth and ninth and so on will be all there on stack, which means we can now offset to any argument and read or write from anywhere on stack. So now you can see that on the ninth offset or the ninth argument, there is the return address. Let us see how we can leak memory using format string. So to leak memory using format string, we can use the percentage p format specifier. So since the memory we want to leak is at the ninth offset on stack, if we give percent nine dollar p, so dollar is used to reference the offset. So we are basically leaking memory from the ninth offset of stack with percent p. You can see that it is the exact same address which was there on the ninth offset. Similarly, we can use the percentage n format specifier. The percentage n format specifier writes the number of bytes that have been printed before the encounter of percentage n. And it can write those many bytes to any memory location you specify using the same format. 
So if I give percentage ten dollar M, it will write the tenth offset on stack. So this is how we can use format string and achieve memory read and write simultaneously. Now we are going to move into the key part of the vulnerabilities. First, we will look into heap overflow. But what is heap? Heap is basically dynamically allocated memory. And keep in mind that we'll be using the term chunk for the blocks of memory allocated on heap. Now uh, let's take an example and see how the heap looks like when we allocate memory. Here we have a small program and it has two malloc's of size 0x10 and we are going to read input into both of those. But uh, let's see what it, the heap looks like after we run this program. So if you can uh, see this, there is uh, two chunks and the size of the chunks are 0x20. But we gave 0 x 10 how come it is 0 x 20 So what happens is, for every malloc chunk, there is a header of size 0 x 10 So basically, the program adds the, both the sizes and then allocates that size. And our data starts after this header. So as you, as you can see, our data starts just after the header. And the header contains prop size and current size. So this prop size is the size of the previous chunk in memory. And this will be only set if the previous size is free. This is used by free and malloc for offsetting purposes. And next, we'll see a heap overflow program. Here we have a, a similar same program, but instead of taking 0 x 10 as the input size, we are going to read 0 x 20. But the uh, our chunk is only of 0 x 10 size, and we are reading 0 x 20 size. So we definitely have an overflow. But what can we do with the outflow on key? Let's see that. We'll be calling the read with the argument as the chunks address and then the size as 0 x 20. You can see before all calling that read, the data segment part of both the chunks are null because we didn't read anything into the, the chunk set. But after reading the input, you can see the header and the data part of the first chunk is intact and nothing happened, but the size and the prop size field of the next chunk has been corrupted. That is because of the overflow. We can basically we can write into another chunk. This can give us a lot of uh, control. Now we'll see the use of the free. So basically as the name suggests, Use after free means referencing memory after it has been free. And if we are writing into a free memory, we can have consequences like program crashing and it can be even molded to get arbitrary memory right. Also, one more thing to keep in mind, when we free a chunk, it goes into linked list. And the type of linked list depends on the size. So for later libcs, if our uh, size of the chunk is greater than 0 x 400, it goes into a double link list, else it will go into a single link list. This is a visual representation of how the chunks look in memory when that it is free. So we have two chunks which are free. So the first chunk point to the second chunk and which is pointing to null. Now let's see a small program uh, to see how we can leak using use of free. So here we have a similar program to the before one. But here, the size of the chunk is 0x500. And we are taking into, into that buffer chunk and then freeing it. And then we are printing the contents of that chunk. We can see what happens. Here, we can see before freeing the chunk 1, the data part of the chunk 1 has our input. And we can also see the data part of the chunk 2 has nothing because we have not read anything into it. But after freeing, the data part of the chunk 1 has FT and DK. Basically, because the size of the chunk is greater than 0 x 400, it goes into a double link list. And if there is only one element in the link list, then both the FT and DK will point to main arena, which is in libc. So we have libc addresses on the chunk. And we can also see the prop size of 
the chunk 2 has been set as i said earlier it will be only set if the previous chunk is free and since we are going to print the contents of the chunk 1 we'll be able to get leaks using this so now guys that we have had an overview of primitives and how common vulnerabilities can be chained to form exploitation primitives we can very well move forward and introduce fp analyze but first why fp analyze see we play a lot of ctfs write exploits and have fun during the ctf but most of the times when we muster an arbitrary memory write in the challenge we go for overwriting libc global variables like malloc and freehook wait what are these you can think of these hooks to contain functions which are called to initialize some stuff when a first call to malloc or free happens see after the first call to malloc or free happens the memory of these hooks is nulled out so that in subsequent calls reinitialization does not happen but if we can write a function which can give us shell to those hooks the next call to malloc or free will give us code execution see in most cases we go for overwriting these hooks with functions which give us shell immediately these functions are called one gadgets see bear with me for the new terms being encountered but it will be clear so now the thing with these so called shell functions or one gadgets is that they pose some constraints which have to be satisfied in order to pop a shell in most cases the constraints get satisfied but you know guys life is not so easy as it seems and there are cases where the constraints for any one gadgets may not satisfy at all this is very frustrating moment for us as ctf players now we have to hunt function pointers which are called internally in libc functions which is a very boring and a tedious task so why go through all the hassle in searching for function pointers when fp analyze comes to the rescue with fp analyze you can find all function pointers which are called during the execution of program perfect just what we need see not only this there are also times when you have an arbitrary memory write but no calls to malloc or free happens which means there is no option for overwriting those hooks that we have discussed now but in this case also we can fire up fp analyze get all the relevant function pointers and overwrite them with the shell functions and get code execution effortlessly apart from all this fp analyze can be quite useful when combined with exploit automation tools it can also be useful in dynamic analysis now we are going to see how fp analyze is working so the main idea of fp analyze is hooking init init is basically the function that is called at the beginning of a program so because we are hooking init we will not be losing any pointers and the next thing that the program does is it passes passes the shared library's writable memory and then finds pointers and when it finds pointers it stores these pointers in and its address in global array and then continue with the normal execution of the program now we can see the core idea behind fp analyze the idea is to handle signal execution 6b which is basically segmentation fault so what happens is where when we parse the writable memory we get the pointers and we overwrite those pointers with index into the array so basically it's like if we are getting the pointer it is the first if it is the first pointer then we overwrite those with one and if it is a second pointer then we overwrite it with two and similarly we overwrite every pointer on writable memory and since this is overwritten when the program tries to call the pointer it is going to call the index so which basically will set fault and our fp analyze will catch the set faults and register that pointer as used then it also replaces the memory back to the original address because we already found this pointer once so if the program tries to use the same pointer again we don't want it to set fault again so we'll replace it with the original memory now we'll see the internals of implementation of fp analyze the first thing that the program does is after hook, uh, while hooking in it we'll first get the addresses we get the addresses from a file called slash box slash slash maps this contains the memory map of the current program so we can open this then parse the data in this to get the relevant addresses like libc base 
binary base, Lipsy executable, stack, and similar addresses. And we use flags, simple flags like is first Lipsy or is first binary to make sure that we are getting the correct address. And we'll store these addresses in global variables for later use. And after this, we are going to parse the writable memory of both binary as well as Lipsy. And since we know the addresses of both the, those, we can go through the entire segment and then find each and every pointer and check if it lies in the executable region. If it is in the executable region, it means that there is a possibility that the program might use this pointer. So we store this in array while simultaneously tending the memory with the op index. We can see an example here what happens with the while parsing. Here we can see before tending, the BSS have three addresses, which is three pointers, which are win1, win2, win3 functions pointers. And after tainting, these values have been overwritten with 1, 2, and 3, which is basically the index into the array. Then after parsing the VSS, we are going to handle the segfaults. So we need a good handler so that we can replace the memory back to the original value so that the program will continue execution. So what, what happens is, when the program tries to call the index, if the RIP value will be corrupted. The RIP value will have the index because if it was a real address, the call will have make the RIP value into that address. And since it is not that, and since it is our index that we are going to call, RIP will have index. We are going to get the RIP value from the context structure of a signal handler. Then we are also going to use built-in frame address function to get the stack address of the caller function. This is so that we can get the return address of the function. We need a return address to calculate the offset of the instruction which calls the segfault. So this will be this will make it easier for debugging purposes. We can see an example for handling segfault. Um, on the left side, we can see the same memory that we got after the parsing happened. We can see there are one, two, and three. And here at this point, the RIP value is two, which means the second pointer is the one that was called. So after the handler executes, we can see that the that only that memory has been replaced with the original value. And now if the program tries to call this again, there will not be any problem. Uh, by the, in the inside the handling support, we need to figure out whether the pointer that we have is a libc pointer or a binary pointer. So for this, since we have the uh, address addresses, basically we have the limit of R. So we have the base of the binary and we have the end of the binary. So we can check whether the pointer lies in libc or binary, and then we can subsequently print the offsets. From if it is libc pointer, we'll print the offset from libc base, and if it is binary pointer, we'll print the offset from binary base. So guys, now that we've had an overview of how FPNLIS works, we can go for a short live demonstration. But before that, we'll just see how we can use FPNLIS. Here, in this screenshot, you can see that we can just do dot slash run dot sh and the binary name from which you want to extract function pointers. So what we just do is we LD preload the shared object FPNLIS and run the binary with it. So let us see FPNLIS in action. You can see that when I run a sample binary with our FPNLIS, uh, if the function pointer is detected inside binary, which means the BSS segment, it will print the offset from the binary base. And if the function pointer is detected inside the libc BSS segment, it will print the offset from libc base. There are some instructions given which you can study. And if the instruction if the instruction is also found, then it gives the instruction offset. If it's from the executable segment of the binary, it will give the offset from the binary. And if it's in the executable segment of libc, it will give the offset from the libc base. Yeah, so now we can just go for a short demonstration of how FPNLIS works. Uh, I hope you can see the screen. 
Yeah. So here we have we had encountered a challenge during HSCTF, which was conducted this year. So in this challenge, uh, it was a scenario where we could not use any one gadgets. Uh, we kind of tried running a brute force in a range. Just don't worry about the exploit. We had a arbitrary write primitive. Uh, we could write anything anywhere. So we thought of writing the one gadgets that we have discussed before to malloc hook. So as you as you could remember, malloc hook is the hook that is called whenever a call to malloc happens. So when I when we tried running the brute force script with all the one gadgets, uh, we saw that all the one gadgets had failed. So we were in kind of dilemma. But then wait, to save us, we had FP analyze. One thing is that since the libc provided was different, uh, we had to use Docker environment to run our FP analyze. Since we are already preloading a shared object, it is not quite possible to preload libc again. So now what I'll do is I'll, yeah, so yeah, so after, after calculating all the function pointers from FP analyze, uh, you can see that FP analyze has given function pointers, uh, which are this. Yeah, so now what we do is we kind of run a brute force script, uh, trying out all the one gadgets on all the function pointers. So if a function pointer works, it will just print this, the function pointer also. Yeah, so we run the script. And you can see that in the very first run itself, FP analyze has given a shell, the function pointers which were found. Subsequent runs we will not get, but uh, we were quite surprised to see another hit here. So, uh, so out of the function pointers we detected, two function pointers gave us shell. Now, we will see how FP analyze works with even uh, Linux binaries like uh, the bin SH binary and the echo, echo binary. So this is just to show how versatile FP analyze is. So you can see that the run.sh is having the this thing. Now you can see that the SH binary I've copied from the bin SH. So FP analyze works fine on all this. Note that this segmentation fault that you are seeing is simply because we have preloaded a shared object. It's it's not a bug or something. It's it's just that we have preloaded a shared object. We cannot execute commands like ls or cd. FPNLS works well with even the cat binary also. And even the echo binary. So now that you have seen how FP analyze works, there are some limitations to its working though. For now, we support only Linux binaries. And another thing is that we cannot keep track of libraries which have been loaded after the call to init function. This can happen in some cases. And for now, FP analyze remains tested only on C, C++ binaries. And there are some scenarios where a shared object file cannot be preloaded. In those cases also, we cannot use FP analyze. So let us have a quick rewind of what we have done so far in our talk. So initially, we saw uh, how primitives and common vulnerabilities can be chained together to get arbitrary memory read and write. Then all this paved the way for our introduction to FP analyze. Then we saw how FP analyze is useful and had a quick overview of its working. Towards the end, we had a demonstration of FP analyze and saw a few limitations of it. So you can find FP analyze, the source code, it's already open sourced and I've posted it on Slack. The GitHub link is also here. And you can reach us through our Twitter IDs. 
so that's it from our side guys thank you so much if you have any questions please feel free to ask oh yes we're back there we go um so Rific Sarah, thank you very much for that you know uh we don't have any questions yet folks please post your questions in the comments we do have how long do we have for questions well we've got a uh we've we've got about 10 minutes for questions if we if we can fit them in and if any come up but in the meantime you opened with the fact that you're both students at university. Is it? Are you in your third years now or second years? Yes, yes. Yeah, both in your third years. I'm, I'm always impressed, actually, frankly, because when I was at university, my interests lay in sleeping, drinking and partying. Uh, and yet your interests seem to be actually creating tools, going out and doing CTFs and then doing presentations on it all. I mean, talk about, well, fantastic achievements. And... Um, it uh, well, it makes me feel somewhat ashamed of what I did thirty years ago. But uh, but yeah, I just want to congratulate you. You're part of, as you say, one of the best uh, CTF teams around. Um, and not only that, um, since we're you know we started today talking about community, the contributions you make to the community as a result are just uh, fantastic. So thank you very much indeed. You are helping make. Uh, the information security uh, community a better place. Thank you so much, sir. Very and thank you, time. thank you for your presentation as well. I see we still don't have any questions, so yeah. Um, uh, well, they can I always mean, contact us on Slack. Absolutely, ask questions on yeah. Slack. I think you probably yeah. you were so thorough anyway that I think you've probably addressed them all uh, anyway. But um, and you did you say the tool was available to to for people to to download now so, sorry i didn't get you sorry. did you say that uh, the tool is available to download yes yes it is open sourced and i've posted the github link in slack channel itself general oh, channel. God. you're taking all my questions away from you okay so um <laughs> brilliant well, there aren't any questions, so we are going to move on. Ritvig, Sarag, thank you very much indeed. Thank you so much, sir, for Look forward to thank seeing you, so you hang around in uh, you, Slack panels and have a lovely rest of day. And here's your virtual applause. Woo! Thank you indeed. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sir.